September 30th, 1991. It's just after 6 p.m. There is an employee at the time that works at this airport. His name is Wes Weaver. He's in one of these hangars somewhere on the grounds of this airport. Matter of fact, it could have been one of these hangars. Who knows? So he approaches Wes and he says, hey, I need a ride out west. And not really sure what the conversation was, but he's only an employee here. He doesn't own a plane that I'm aware of. So I'm sure he tells the guy, like, like I don't have a plane and I can't help you. Now, this guy was very, very adamant about needing a ride going out west. As a matter of fact, he was so serious, he took off his leather bomber jacket to trade him just for a seat on one of these planes because he, he needs to go somewhere and it's very, very important. Now, according to Wes Weaver in the episode, uh, the guy wasn't on drugs. He didn't appear crazy, but he just he appeared that he was very, very serious in needing a ride out of town. Finally, he tells this guy, he's like, listen, uh, I can't help you. I don't have a plane and maybe you should leave now. So after, you know, them going back and forth, the man, he just decides, you know, OK, it's quite obvious that I'm not going to be able to get this ride on the plane. So he just turns around and he walks away. He would have walked away right onto this street right here. And uh, more than likely, I'm guessing he probably would have would have hung a, a left. Could have been a right, but I'm thinking he hung a left. Now, little did Wes Weaver know is that this guy, he was very, very determined to catch a ride on an airplane, whether the seat was available or not. About 30 minutes or so after the altercation, the employee, he leaves the grounds of the airport and he has his radio with him, which tells me that he is still on the clock. So he pulls out on this street, hangs a left, and as he's driving down the street, he notices the guy that he just was talking to that was asking for a ride out west. So this guy just kind of bolts from across the street over to this very fence right here and he scales it so he jumps the fence and he's like running right there towards the uh, runway and on the runway is a plane and it's taking off it's on its way to memphis and this guy starts radioing his uh you know the security and said hey this guy just jumped the the fence and he's running towards the airplane as Wes is on the radio with the security, letting them know that this guy just jumped this fence and he's running towards a plane that is about to take off. This guy is just running for all it's worth towards this airplane just as it's about to take off. Now, he jumps on the plane and now the plane is starting to go down the runway and it starts taken off now at this time it's still on the ground and it's doing about 125 miles an hour and this guy is hanging on to the plane it's doing 125 and as soon as it takes off into the sky now this plane is going almost 200 miles an hour now according to an eyewitness on the ground as they were looking at the plane they seen something fall down from the plane onto the ground now, about this time, the sun sets and it's nightfall. They call the police and now they're searching the perimeter of this airport for this guy that just jumped off this plane or fell off this plane. And eventually they found who they were looking for. He had fell on top of a fence somewhere on the border of this airport. Now, when they got him, he had no wallet on him. He had no ID and there was no real way to identify him. There's a discrepancy in the episode in which the height 
from where the unknown man fell from the plane. Authorities were saying that it was anywhere from 3,000 to 3,500 feet. Now, you had a woman who seen the man fall from the plane. 3,500 feet is pretty high up in the sky. I would find it almost impossible that someone would be able to see somebody fall from a plane at that altitude. I'm guessing that the plane was a lot lower to the ground than that. I'm, I'm guessing 500 feet. And mind you, the plane at this time now is doing 200 miles an hour and there's nothing to hang on to. So this guy is just probably hanging on to the wing for dear life and the pilot of this plane would have absolutely no idea that there was somebody on his plane. Now, when they took his body to the coroner's office for autopsy, uh, they noticed that this guy was in pretty good shape. As a matter of fact, they were suspecting in the original, originally, that he might have been a part of a Chippendales dancer troupe that was in town a week previous. Uh, but of course, they got a hold of the uh, people who run that show and you no, know, uh, all Chippendales were accounted for. And so the only thing that they remarked during the autopsy was that, let me try not to get hit while I'm talking. The only thing that they remarked was that he was in, he was in really good shape. Uh, he had, his body was completely tanned. There was no tan lines and that he had uh, shaved pubic hair. So they're guessing this guy's in shape. He's all tanned. He, he cares about physical fitness. He cares about his body and the way he looks. This guy was well kept. He wasn't a homeless guy. He wasn't dirty. His fingernails were clean. He had no alcohol or drugs in his system. Nobody knows who this guy is. So I'm, I'm imagining somebody, somebody from law enforcement contacted Unsolved Mysteries to do an episode on who they called the Paducah Plane Jumper. And the uh, episode originally aired in 1992. And it has always perplexed law enforcement officials in Paducah. Who is this guy? Why did he, why was he so desperate to go out west? Like, I mean, you're you're unable to hang on to anything. It's not like there's grips or you, you know you can strap yourself to something. You're just hanging on, and that's it. So of course I'm imagining that they believe that either he was intending on ending his own life or uh, that he was perhaps uh, suffering some uh, some kind of uh, mental deficit. When they interviewed the employee that had the interaction with him, he didn't get the impression at the time that this guy was crazy. He just kind of understood that this guy was very, very serious about wanting to get on a plane and was, you know, almost, you know, hounding him to let him on, but he couldn't do nothing about it. We fast forward about seven years it's 1999, a woman by the name of Deanna Duker is watching a rebroadcast of Unsolved Mysteries. And in this episode, she's watching the story of a man who fell from a plane here in Paducah, Kentucky. They don't know who he is. He's a John Doe. She's watching this episode. And when they start talking about the physical characteristics coupled that with the picture of the reconstruction drawing of his body, of his face, she says, that looks like Brian. Brian Duker, 28 years of age, was her stepson. Uh, he had been missing for about the same amount of time as that episode where it shows and tells the date of when that uh, incident occurred. So she waits for her husband, Gerald, to get home, and she tells him about the episode that she's seen. 
Now, they contact the authorities here in Paducah and they start uh, sharing photos of what Brian looked like. Now, the physical description of the John Doe was that he was in good shape. Like they said, they thought that he was a Chippendales dancer, a part of a troupe that had been in town the week previous. And Brian Duker, 28 years of age, was in very good shape. Uh, he would run marathons. And when he was 22, he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, which because he, him not wanting to take his medication, uh, he would always have a very difficult time keeping a job. Uh, the last time that somebody had seen him, I believe it was a family member, uh, he was at his apartment and he was acting very irritable and just acting a, a little manic. So they probably figured he's going through an episode, you know, leave him alone. When they hadn't heard from their son for quite some time, they go to his apartment and when they get inside, they see a note, uh, almost like a, a will, something along those lines. Basically, the note said, I'm going to go uh, mountain climbing out west. And they never heard from their son ever again. So they, they probably figured that uh, he was probably just homeless on the street, didn't know who he was, like many people that we see when we just passed him by every day. So when they shared the pictures with the coroner's office here at Paducah, even though the picture, the, the, it looks like Brian Duker, they're not convinced that that's him. I don't know why, because if you look closely at the nose, that's a, that's a pretty uh, close comparison. That is him. So it would be about another couple years before a family member, a uh, friend of the family, excuse me, uh, a private detective was able to get uh, fingerprints from uh, an arrest that uh, uh, happened to Brian uh, some, t some part of his life. So they take the fingerprints from his arrest record, compare it to the coroner's fingerprints, and yes, they do have a match. It is finally known John Doe's identity, 28-year-old Brian Stanley Duker. Now, this was his original stone right here where it talks about him falling from the plane. And then when he, you know, when they finally found out his identity, they got this newer stone. Now, I am in Paducah. This is the Oak Grove Cemetery. And the family, the family, you know, they're all from Cincinnati. They decided to leave him here just because uh, they felt that since the town was trying in vain to find out his identity, that he was almost like a uh, surrogate son of Paducah, Kentucky. Uh, just one of the many episodes on Unsolved Mysteries that I'll never forget. Just, you know, me being a kid at the time watching it, I, I didn't understand mental illness really. I mean, I knew there were people that had problems, but I didn't, I just figured, you know, they're all crazy. And that was it. Uh, but this, you know, this kid right here, 28 years old, call him a kid. He's a grown man, but he was a grown man. But he was a kid compared to my age now. And, uh, you know, just uh, mental illness. And, you know, that's all that you can say that possessed him to try to, to jump on that plane like that. Um, His parents uh, have uh, passed away. Uh, his stepmother, too. Uh, his mother also had schizophrenia, which oftentimes we know is hereditary. And uh, so the father, the mother, and the stepmother have all passed away within the last uh, about six or seven years or so. Rest in peace to Brian Stanley Duker, and I'm glad that he finally has his name so 
we know who he is and we know just a but a small glimpse into the life of Brian and the demons in his head that possessed him to do that. So rest in peace. And uh, this is definitely a cemetery that I need to come back to. Uh, weather today is not the best. It's raining off and on. But uh, I, will, I will come back. There's some older uh, monuments here that I, I really want to go check out. It's a cool cemetery. Uh, I've walked around for about 20, 30 minutes just looking around. So if anybody is ever in Paducah, come check it out. It's a nice looking cemetery. All right, guys. That is it for the video. I'm heading out of here. I am going that away west. Many, many stories to tell. So little time. I'll catch up with you on the next video. Be good. Peace out.